Section 14 of 1916 First Chapters Collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. 1916 First Chapters Collection by Various. Section 14 Leatherface by Baroness Orsi. Prologue. Mon, September, 1572. It lacked two hours before the dawn on this sultry night early in September. The crescent moon had long ago sunk behind a bank of clouds in the west, and not a sound stirred in the low-lying land around the besieged city. To the south the Bouviac fires of Alva's camp had died out one by one, and here the measured tread of the sentinels on their beat alone broke the silence of the night. To the north, where valorous Orange, with a handful of men, undisciplined, unpaid, and rebellious, vainly tried to provoke his powerful foe into a pitched battle, relying on God for the result, there was greater silence still. The sentinels, wearied and indifferent, had dropped to sleep at their post. The troops, already mutinous, only held to their duty by the powerful personality of the prince, slept as soundly as total indifference to the cause for which they were paid to fight could possibly allow. In his tent even Orange, tired out with ceaseless watching, had gone to rest. His guards were in a profound sleep. Then it was that from the south there came a stir, and from Alva's entrenchments waves of something alive that breathed in the darkness of the night were set in motion, like when the sea rolls inward to the shore. Whispered words set this living mass on its way, and anon it was crawling along, swiftly and silently, more silently than incoming waves on a flat shore, on and on, always northward in the direction of the Prince of Orange's camp, like some gigantic snake that creeps with belly close to the ground. Don Ramon, whispered a voice in the darkness, let Captain Romero deal with the sentinels and lead the surprise attack whilst you yourself make straight for the prince's tent. Overpower his guard first, then seize his person. Two hundred ducats will be your reward, remember, if you bring Orange back here, a prisoner, and a ducat for each of your men. These were the orders, and Don Raymond de Ligné sped forward with six hundred arquebusiers, all picked men, they wore their shirts over their armor, so that in the melee which was to come they might recognize one another in the gloom. Less than a league of flat pasture land lay between Alva's entrenchments at St. Florian near the gates of the beleaguered Mons, and Orange's camp at Ermonier. But at St. Florian men stirred and planned and threatened, whilst at Ermonier even the sentinel slept. Noble-hearted Orange had raised the standard of revolt against the most inexorable oppression of an entire people which the world had ever known, and he could not get more than a handful of patriots to fight for their own freedom against the tyranny and the might of Spain, whilst mercenary troops were left to guard the precious life of the indomitable champion of religious and civil liberties. The moving mass of Delignes, arquebusiers, had covered half a league of the intervening ground, their white shirts, only just distinguishable in the gloom, made them look like ghosts. Only another half-league, less, perhaps, separated them from their goal, and still no one stirred in Orange's camp. Then it was that something roused the sentinels from their sleep. A rough hand shook first one, then the other by the shoulder, and out of the gloom a peremptory voice whispered hurriedly, "'Quick! Awake! Sound the alarm! An encampasada is upon you! You will all be murdered in your sleep!' and even before the drowsy sentinels had time to rouse themselves or to rub their eyes, the same rough hand had shaken the prince's guard, the same peremptory voice had called, Awake! The Spaniards are upon you. In the prince's tent a faint light was glimmering. He himself was lying fully dressed and armed upon a couch. At the sound of the voice of his guard's stirring and of the noise and bustle of awakening camp, he sat up just in time to see a tall figure in the entrance of his tent. The feeble light threw but into a dim relief this tall figure of a man, clad in dark, shapeless woolen clothes, wearing a hood of the same dark stuff over his head and a leather mask over his face. Leatherface, exclaimed the prince as he jumped to his feet. What is it? A night attack, replied a muffled voice behind the mask. Six hundred arquebusiers, 
They are but half a league away. I would have been here sooner, only the night is so infernally dark. I caught my foot in a rabbit hole and nearly broke my ankle. I am as lame as a Jew's horse, but still in time, he added, as he hastily helped the prince to adjust his armor and straighten out his clothes. The camp was alive now, with call to arms and rattle of steel, horses snorting and words of command flying to and fro. Don Ramon de Lignier, a quarter of a league away, heard these signs of troops, well on the alert, and knew that the surprise attack had failed. Six hundred arquebusiers, though they be picked men, were not sufficient for a formal attack on the Prince of Orange's entire cavalry. Even mercenary and undisciplined troops will fight valiantly when their lives depend upon their valor. De Lignier thought it best to give the order to return to camp. And the waves of living men, which had been set in motion an hour ago, now swiftly and silently went back the way they came. Don Ramon, when he came once more in the camp at St. Florian, and in the presence of Alva's captain-in-chief, had to report the failure of the night attack which had been so admirably planned. The whole camp at Ermigny was astir, he said as he chawed the ends of his heavy mustache, for he was sorely disappointed. I could not risk an attack under those conditions. Our only chance of winning was by surprise. Who gave the alarm? queried Don Frederic de Toledo, who took no pains to smother the curses that rose to his lips. The devil, I suppose, growled Don Ramon de Ligny, savagely. And out at Ermigny, in Orange's tent, the man who is called Leatherface was preparing to go as quietly and mysteriously as he had come. They won't be on you, Monseigneur, he said, now that they know your troops are astir. But if I were you, he added grimly, I would have every one of those sentinels shot at dawn. They were all of them fast asleep when I arrived. He gave the military salute, and would have turned to go without another word, but that the prince caught him peremptorily by the arm. In the meanwhile, Messire, how shall I thank you again, he asked. By guarding your precious life, Monseigneur, replied the man simply. The cause of freedom in the Low Countries would never survive your loss. Well, retorted the Prince of Orange with a winning smile, if that be so, then the cause of our freedom owes as much to you as it does to me. Is it the tenth time, or the twelfth, that you have saved my life? Since you will not let me fight with you, I'll let you do anything you wish, Messire, for you would be as fine a soldier as you are a loyal friend. But are you not content with the splendid services which you are rendering to us now? Putting aside mine own life, which mayhap is not worthless, how many times has your warning saved mine and my brother's troops from surprise attacks? How many times have Nur Carme or Don Frederick's urgent appeals for reinforcements failed, through your intervention, to reach the Duke of Alva until our own troops were able to rally? Ah, Messire, believe me, God himself has chosen you for this work. The work of a spy, Monseigneur, said the other, not without a touch of bitterness. Nay, if you call yourself a spire, messire, then shall the name of spy be henceforth a name of glory to its wearer, synonymous with the loftiest patriotism and the noblest self-sacrifice. He held out his hand to the man with the mask, who bent his tall figure over in dutiful respect. You see how well I keep to my share of the compact, messire. Never once, even whilst we were alone, hath your name escaped my lips." For which act of graciousness, Monseigneur, I do offer you my humble thanks. May God guard your highness through every peril. The cause of justice and of liberty rests in your hands. After another deeply respectful bow, he finally turned to go. He had reached the entrance of the tent, when once more the prince spoke to him. When shall I see you again, Leatherface? he asked cheerily. When your highness's precious life or the safety of your army are in danger, replied the man. God reward you, murmured Orange fervently, as the man with the mask disappeared into the night. Book One, Brussels, Chapter One, The Blood Council One. Less than a month later, and tyranny is once more triumphant. Mons has capitulated. Orange has withdrawn his handful of mutinous troops into Holland. Valenciennes has been destroyed, and Mechlin beautiful, gracious, august Mechlin, with her cathedrals and her trade halls, her ancient monuments of art and civilization, has been given over for three days to the lust and rapine of Spanish soldiery. Three whole days, 
Even now we think on those days and shudder, shudder at what we know, at what the chroniclers have told us, the sacking of churches, the pillaging of monasteries, the massacre of peaceful, harmless citizens. Three whole days during which the worst demons that infest hell itself, the worst demons that inspire the hideous passions of men, greed, revenge, and cruelty, were let loose upon the stately city whose sole office had been that she had for twenty-four hours harbored Orange and his troops within her gates and closed them against the tyrant's soldiery. Less than a month and Orange is a fugitive, and all the bright hopes for the cause of religious and civil freedom are once more dashed to the ground. It seems as if God himself hath set his face against the holy cause. Mon has fallen, and Mechlin is reduced to ashes, and over across the borders the king of France has caused ten thousand of his subjects to be massacred, one holy day, the feast of St. Bartholomew, ten thousand of them, just because their religious beliefs did not coincide with his own. The appalling news drove Orange and his small army to flight. He had reckoned on help from the king of France, instead of that promised help, the news of the massacre of ten thousand Protestants. Catholic Europe was horror-stricken at the crime committed in the name of religion, but in the Low Countries, Spanish tyranny had scored a victory. The ignoble Duke of Alva triumphed, and the cause of freedom, in Flanders, in Hainault, and Brabant, received a blow from which it did not again recover for over three hundred years. 2. Outwardly, the house where the Duke of Alva lodged in Brussels was no different to many of the same size in the city. It was built of red brick, with stone base and finely carved cornice, and had a high slate roof with picturesque dormer windows therein. The windows on the street level were solidly grilled and were ornamented with richly carved pediments, as was the massive doorway, too. The door itself was of heavy oak, and above it there was a beautifully wrought niche which held a statue of the Virgin. On the whole, it looked a well-constructed, solid and roomy house, and Mademoiselle de Jassy, its owner, had placed it at the disposal of the lieutenant governor when he first arrived in Brussels, and he had occupied it ever since. The idler, as he strolled past the house, would hardly pause to look at it, if he did not happen to know that behind its brick walls and grilled windows, a work of oppression more heinous than this world had ever known before, was being planned and carried out by a set of cruel and inexorable tyrants against an independent country and a freedom-loving people. Here in the dining hall, the Duke of Alva would preside at the meetings of the Grand Council, the Council of Blood, sitting in a high-backed chair which had the arms of Spain emblazoned upon it. Juan de Vargas and Alberic de Rio usually sat to the right and left of him. Del Rio, indolent and yielding, a mere tool for the carrying out of every outrage, every infamy which the fiendish brain of those tyrants could devise, wherewith to crush the indomitable spirit of a proud nation, jealous of its honor and of its liberties, and of Varga, Alva's double and worthy lieutenant, no tool he, but a terrible reality, active and resourceful in the invention of new forms of tyranny, new fetters for the curbing of stiff-necked Flemish and Dutch burghers, new methods for wringing rivers of gold out of a living stream of tears and blood. De Vargas. The very name stinks in the nostrils of honest men even after the lapse of centuries. It conjures up the hideous image of a human bloodhound, lean and sallow of visage, with drooping, heavy-lidded eyes and a flaccid mouth, a mouth that sneered and jested when men, women, and children were tortured and butchered, eyes that gloated at sight of stake and scaffold and gibbet, and within the inner man, a mind intent on the science of murder and rapine and bloodshed. Alva the will that commanded, Vargas the brain that devised, Del Rio the hand that accomplished. Men sent by Philip II of Spain, the most fanatical tyrant the world has ever known, to establish the abhorrent methods of the Spanish Inquisition in the Low Countries in order to consolidate Spanish rule there and wrest from prosperous Flanders and Barbant and Hainault from Holland and the Dutch provinces, enough gold to irrigate the thirsty soil of Spain. The river of gold which will flow from the Netherlands to Madrid shall be a yard deep. So had Alva boasted when his infamous master sent him to quell the revolt, which had noble-hearted Orange for its leader, a revolt born of righteous indignation and an inconquerable love of freedom and justice. 
to mold the Netherlands into abject vassals of Spain, to break their independence of spirit by terrorism and by outrage, to force Spanish ideas, Spanish culture, Spanish manners, Spanish religion upon these people of the North, who loathe tyranny and worship their ancient charters and privileges, that was the task which the Duke of Alva set himself to do, a task for which he needed the help of men as tyrannical and unscrupulous as himself. Granville had begun the work. Alva was completing it. The stake, the scaffold, the gibbet, for all who had one thought of justice, one desire for freedom. Mon raised to the ground. Valenciennes, a heap of ruins and ashes. Mechlin, a hecatomb. Men, women, and children outraged and murdered. Whole families put to the torture to wring gold from unwilling givers. Churches destroyed. Monasteries ransacked. That was the work of the Grand Council, the odious Council of Blood, the members of which have put to shame the very name of religion, for they dared to pretend that they acted in its name. Alva, de Vargas, del Rio, a trinity of fiends whose deeds would shame the demons in hell. But there were others, too, and, O oh ye gods, were they not infinitely more vile, since their hands reeked with blood of their own kith and kin? Alva and his two bloodhounds were strangers in a strange land, owing allegiance to Spain alone. But Councillor Hessels sat on the same infamous board, and he was a patrician of Barbant. And there was Pierre Arsen, president of Artois. There was Berlaymont and Vigloui and Hopper, gentlemen, save the mark, and burghers of Flanders or Hainault or the Dutch provinces. And who can name such creatures without a shudder of loathing? 3. As for Don Ramon de Ligny, he was just the usual type of Spanish soldier, a grandee of Spain, direct descendant of the Cid, so he averred, yet disdained to prove it. For in him there was no sense of chivalry, just personal bravery and no more, the same kind of bravery you would meet in a tiger or in a jaguar. In truth, there was much in common between Don Ramon and the wild feline tribes that devastated the deserts. He had the sinuous movements, the languorous gestures of those creatures, and his eyes, dark and velvety at times, at others almost of an orange tint, had all the cruel glitter which comes into the eyes of the leopard when he is out to kill. Otherwise Don Ramon was a fine-looking man, dark-skinned and dark-eyed, a son of the South, with all those cajoling ways about him which please and so often deceive the women. He it was who had been in command at Mechlin, entrusted by General de Norcarme with the hideous task of destroying the stately city, and he had done it with a will. Overproud of his achievements, he had obtained leave to make personal report of them to the lieutenant governor, and thus it was that on the second day of October, 1572, he was present at the council board, talking with easy grace and no little satisfaction of all that he had done, of churches which he had raised to the ground, the houses which he had sacked, of the men, women, and children whom he had turned out naked and starving into the streets. We labored hard for three days, he said, and the troops worked with a will, for there were heavy arrears of pay due to them, and we told them to make up those arrears in Mechlin, since they wouldn't get any money from headquarters. Oh, Mechlin got all that she deserved. Her accursed citizens can now repent at leisure of their haste in harboring Orange and his rebel troops. His voice was deep and mellow, and even the guttural Spanish consonants sounded quite soft when he spoke them. Through half-closed lids his glance swept from time to time over the eager faces around the board, and his slender hands emphasized the hideous narrative with a few graceful gestures. He looked just the true type of grand seigneur telling a tale of mild adventure and of sport, and now and then he laughed, displaying his teeth, sharp and white like the fangs of a leopard's cub. No one interrupted him, and Councillor Hessels fell gradually, as was his wont, into a gentle doze from which he roused himself now and again in order to murmur drowsily, to the gallows with the mole. Vigloui and Hopper and de Berlaymont tried hard to repress a shudder. They were slaves of Spain, these gentlemen of the Low Countries, but not Spanish-born, and were not accustomed from earliest childhood to listen, not only unmoved, but with a certain measure of delight, to these tales of horror. But there was nothing in what Don Ramon said of which they disapproved. They were, all of them, 
loyal subjects of the king, and the very thought of rebellion was abhorrent to them. But it was passing strange that the Duke of Alva made no comment on the young captain's report. There he sat, at the head of the table, silent and moody, with one bony fist clenched above a letter which lay open beneath his hand, and which bore a large red seal with the royal arms of Spain impressed upon it. Not a word of praise or blame did he speak. His heavy brows were contracted in a sullen frown, and his protruding eyes were veiled beneath the drooping lids. De Vargas, too, was silent. De Vargas, who loved to gloat over such tales as Don Ramon had to tell. De Vargas, who believed that these rebellious low countries could only be brought into subjection by such acts of demoniacal outrage as the Spanish soldiery had just perpetrated in Mons and in Mechlin. He, too, appeared moody today, and the story of a sick woman and young children being dragged out of their beds and driven out to perish in the streets while their homes were being pillaged and devastated left him taciturn and unmoved. Don Ramon made vain pretense not to notice the lieutenant governor's moodiness, nor yet de Vargas's silence, but those who knew him best, and de Vargas was among these, plainly saw that irritation had seized upon his nerves. He was talking more volubly, and his voice had lost its smoothness, whilst the languor of his gestures had given place to sharp, febrile movements of hands and shoulders which he tried vainly to disguise. Our soldiers, he was saying loudly, did not leave a loaf of bread in the bakeries or a bushel of wheat in the stores of Mechlin. The rich citizens we hanged at a rate of twenty a day, and I drew orders for the confiscation of their estates to the benefit of our most gracious king and Caesarian lord. I tell you, we made quick work of all the rebels. Stone no longer stands on stone in Mechlin today. Its patricians are beggars, its citizens are scattered." We have put to the torture and burned at the stake those who refused to give us their all. A month ago Mechlin was a prosperous city. She gave of her wealth and of her hospitality to the rebel troops of Orange. Today she and her children have ceased to be. Are you not satisfied? He brought his clenched fist crashing down upon the table, surely a very unusual loss of restraint in a grandee of Spain, but obviously he found it more and more difficult to keep his temper under control and those dark eyes of his were now fixed with a kind of fierce resentment upon the impassive face of the duke. Councillor Hessels, only half awake, reiterated with drowsy emphasis, to the gallows with them. Send them all to the gallows. Still the duke of Alva was silent, and de Vargas did not speak. Yet it was the duke himself who had given the order for the destruction of Mechlin, as a warning to other cities, he had said. And now he sat at the head of the table, sullen, moody and frowning, and Don Ramon felt an icy pang of fear gripping him by the throat. The thought that censure of his conduct was brewing in the lieutenant governor's mind caused him to lose the last vestige of self-control, for he knew that censure could have but one sequel, quick judgment and the headman's axe. "'Are you not satisfied?' he cried hoarsely. "'What more did you expect? What more ought we to have done? What other proof of zeal does King Philip ask of me?' Thus directly challenged, the duke raised his head and looked the young man sternly in the face. "'What you have done, Messire,' he said slowly, and the cold glitter in his steely eyes held it in more real and calculating cruelty than the feline savagery of the other men. "'What you have done is good, but it is not enough. What use is there in laying low an entire city, when the one man whose personality holds the whole of this abominable rebellion together still remains unscathed?' You hanged twenty noted citizens a day in Mechlin, you say, he added, with a cynical shrug of his shoulders. I would gladly see every one of them spared, so long as Orange's head fell on the scaffold. Orange has disbanded his army and has fled almost alone into Holland, said Don Ramon sullenly. My orders were to punish Mechlin and not to run after the Prince of Orange. The order to bring the Prince of Orange alive or dead to Brussels and to me takes precedence of every other order, as you well know, Messire, retorted Alva roughly. We decided on that unanimously at the meeting of the Grand Council on the day that I sent Egmont and Horn to the scaffolds and Orange refused to walk into the trap which I had set for him. He always escapes from traps which are set before him, now broke in de Vargas in his calm, even expressionless voice. During the siege of Mons, according to Don Frederick's report, 
no fewer than six surprise night attacks, all admirably planned, failed because Orange appeared to have received timely warning. "'Who should know that better than I, senor?' queried Don Ramon, hotly. "'Seeing that I led most of those attacks myself. They were splendidly planned, our men as silent as ghosts, the night darker than hell. Not a word of the plan was breathed until I gave the order to start. Yet someone gave the alarm. We found Orange's camp astir every time we had to retire. Who but the devil could have given the warning?' A spy more astute than yourselves, quoth Alva dryly. Nay, here interposed Del Rio blandly, I am of the same opinion as Don Ramon de Nunez. There is a subtle agency at work which appears to guard the life of the Prince of Orange. I myself was foiled many a time when I was on his track, with Ribiras, who wields a dagger in the dark more deftly than any man I know. I also employed Lorenzo, who graduated in Venice in the art of poisons, but invariably the prince slipped through our fingers, just as if he had been put on his guard by some mysterious emissary. The loyalists in Flanders, quoth President Viguerie under his breath, declare that the agency which works for the safety of the Prince of Orange is a supernatural one. They speak of a tall, man-like figure whose face is hidden by a mask, and who invariably appears whenever the Prince of Orange's life is in danger. Some people call this mysterious being Leatherface, but no one seems actually to have seen him. It sounds as if he were truly an emissary of the devil. And as the president spoke, a strange silence fell around the council board. Every cheek had become pale, every lip quivered. De Vargas made a quick sign of the cross over his chest. Alva drew a small medal from the inside of his doublet and kissed it devoutly. These men who talked airily of rapine and of violence perpetrated against innocent people— who gloated over torture and misery, which they loved to inflict, were held in the cold grip of superstitious fear, and their trembling lips uttered abject prayers for mercy to the God whom they outraged by every act of their infamous lives. 4. When the Duke of Alva spoke again, his voice was still unsteady. Devil or no devil, he said with an attempt at dignified composure, His Majesty's latest orders are quite peremptory. He desires the death of Orange. He will have no more cities destroyed, and no more wholesale massacres until that great object is attained. Pressure has been brought to bear upon him. The emperor, it seems, has spoken authoritatively and with no uncertain voice. It seems that the destruction of Flemish cities is abhorrent to the rest of Europe. Rebel cities, ejaculated de Berlaymont hotly. Aye, we know well enough that they are rebel cities, quoth Alva fiercely. But what can we do? when a milk-livered weakling wears the imperial crown. Our gracious king himself dares not disregard the emperor's protests, and in his last letter to me he commands that we should hold our hand and neither massacre a population nor destroy a town unless we have proof positive that both are seething with rebellion. Seething with rebellion, exclaimed Don Ramon. Then what of Ghent, which is a very nest of rebels? Ah, retorted Alva, Ghent by the mass, Seniors, all of you who know that accursed city, bring me proof that she harbors Orange or his troops. Bring me proof that she gives him money. Bring me proof that plots against our government are hatched within her walls. I have moral proofs that Orange has been in Ghent lately, that he is levying troops within her very walls. I know that he has received promises of support from some of her most influential citizens. Nay, then, let your highness but give the order, broke in Don Ramon once more. My soldiers would spend three fruitful days in Ghent. As I pointed out to his highness yesterday, rejoined de Vargas, in mellifluous tones, we should reduce Ghent to ashes before she hatches further mischief against us. Once a city hath ceased to be, it can no longer be a source of danger to the state. And, he added blandly, there is more money in Ghent than in any other city of Flanders. And more rebellion in one family there than in the whole population of Brabant, assented Councillor Arsens. I have lived in that accursed city all my life, he continued savagely, and I say that Ghent ought not to be allowed to exist a day longer than is necessary for massing together two or three regiments of unpaid soldiery and turning them loose into the town, just as we did in Mechlin. The others nodded approval. And by the mass, resumed Don Ramon. Enough, Messire, broke in the Duke peremptorily. Who are you, I pray? 
Who are you all to be thus discussing the orders of His Majesty the King? I have transmitted to you His Majesty's orders just as I received them from Madrid yesterday. It is for you, for us all, to show our zeal and devotion at this critical moment in our nation's history, by obeying blindly, wholeheartedly, those gracious commands. Do we want our king to be further embarrassed by a quarrel with the emperor? And what are those orders, I ask you? Wise and Christian-like as usual. His majesty doth not forbid the punishment of rebel cities. No, all he asks is that we deliver Orange unto him, Orange, the arch-traitor, and that in future we prove conclusively to Europe and to Maximilian that when we punish a Flemish city, we do so with unquestioned justice. He paused, and his prominent, heavy-lidded eyes wandered somewhat contemptuously on the sullen faces around the board. Proof, seniors, he said, with a light shrug of the shoulders. Proofs are not difficult to obtain. All you want is a good friend inside the city to keep you well informed. The paid spy is not sufficient. Oft times he is clumsy and himself an object of suspicion. Orange has been in Ghent, seniors. He will go again. He has disbanded his army, but at his call another will spring up. In Ghent, mayhap, where he has so many friends, where money is plentiful and rebellion rife. We must strike at Ghent before she becomes an open menace. You'll never strike at Orange, broke in Councillor Arsens obstinately, while that creature Leatherface is at large. He is said to hail from Ghent, added Viglui, with conviction. Then by the mass, seniors, interposed Alva fiercely, the matter is even more simple than I had supposed, and all this talk and these murmuring savor of treason, meseems. Are you fools and dolts to imagine that when His Majesty's orders were known to me, I did not at once set at work to fulfill them? We want to strike at Ghent, seniors, and want proofs of her rebellion, his Majesty wants those proofs, and he wants the death of Orange. We all desire to raise Ghent to the ground. Then will you give me your close attention, and I will e'en tell you of my plans for attaining all these objects and earning the approval of our gracious King and recognition from the rest of Europe. Then should not Don Ramon de Ligny retire, questioned President Vigli. Surely His Highness's decision can only be disclosed to members of his council." Let Don Ramon stay, interposed de Vargas, with unanswerable authority, even as the young man was preparing to take his leave. The matter is one that in a measure will concern him, seeing that it involves the destinies of the city of Ghent, and that His Highness is pleased to give him the command of our troops stationed in that city. 5. Don Ramon de Ligny glanced up at Vargas with a look of agreeable surprise. The command of the troops in Ghent, of a truth, this was news to him, and happy news indeed. Rumor was current that the Duke of Alva, Lieutenant Governor of the Low Countries and Captain General of the Forces, was about to visit Ghent, and the captain in command there would thus be in a position of doing useful work, mayhap of rendering valuable services, and in any case of being well before the eyes of the Captain General. All the young man's elegant, languid manner had come back to him. He had had a fright, but nothing more and commendation, in the shape of this important promotion, had allayed all his fears. His being allowed to be present at a deliberation of the Grand Council was also a signal mark of favor granted to him, no doubt in recognition of his zeal and loyalty whilst destroying the noble city of Mechlin for the glory of King Philip of Spain. He now resumed his seat at the board, selecting with becoming modesty a place at the bottom of the table, and feeling not the least disconcerted by the wrathful, envious looks which President Viglui and one or two other Netherlanders directed against him. The plan, seniors, which I have in my mind, resumed the Duke, after a slight pause, could never have come to maturity but for the loyal cooperation of Signor Juan de Vargas and of his equally loyal daughter. Let me explain, he continued, seeing the look of astonishment which spread over most of the faces around the board. It is necessary, in view of all that we have said just now, that I should have a means— a tool, I might say, for the working out of a project which has both the death of Orange and the punishment of Ghent for its aim. I have told you that I am morally certain that Orange is operating in Ghent at the present moment. Is it likely that he would leave such a storehouse of wealth and rebellion untouched? Heresy is rampant in Ghent, and treachery goes hand in hand with it. Our spies, unfortunately, have been unable to obtain very reliable information. The inhabitants are astute and wary, 
they hatch their plots with devilish cunning and secrecy. Obviously, therefore, what we want is a loyal worker, an efficient and devoted servant of the king in the very heart of the civic life of the town. If only we can get to know what goes on in the intimate family circles of those townsfolk, I feel sure that we shall get all the proofs that the king desires of the treachery of Ghent. He paused for a moment in order to draw breath. Absolute silence, the silence of tense expectation, hung around the council board. The Netherlanders hung obsequiously on the tyrant's lips. Del Rio leaned back in his chair, seemingly indifferent, and de Vargas was closely watching Don Ramon de Ligny, the young man who was trying to appear calmly interested, but the restless look in his eyes and a slight tremor of his hand betrayed inward agitation. Some of you revered signors, continued the Duke of Alva after a while, in powerful, compelling tones, will perhaps have guessed by now what connection there is in my mind between that vast project which I have just put before you and the daughter of my loyal coadjutor, Don Juan de Vargas. I have arranged that she shall marry a man of influence and position in Ghent, so that she can not only keep me informed of all the intrigues which are brewing in that city against the government of our gracious king, but also become the means whereby we can lure Orange to his doom, capture that mysterious Leatherface, and then deliver Ghent over to Don Ramon's soldiery. He struck the table repeatedly with his fist as he spoke. There was no doubting the power of the man to accomplish what he wanted, as well as the cruelty and vindictiveness wherewith he would pursue any one who dared to attempt to thwart him in his projects. No one thought of interrupting him. Don Ramon kept his agitation under control as best he could, for he felt that de Vargas's eyes still watched him closely. A very admirable idea, now murmured Viglieu obsequiously. As usual on these occasions, it was obvious that he and the other Netherlanders were mere figureheads at the council board. Alva was directing, planning, commanding. De Vargas had been the confidant, and Del Rio would always be the ready tool when needed. But Viglier, de Berlimont, Hessels, and the others were mere servile listeners, ready to give the approbation which was expected of them, and withholding every word of criticism. 6. And doth Donna Lenora de Vargas enter into all these far-reaching schemes, now asked Don Ramon coldly. Meseems they are above a woman's comprehension. De Vargas's persistent glance was irritating his nerves. He threw a challenging look, wholly defiant, across the table at the older man. My daughter, Messire, said the latter loftily, is above all a true Spaniard. She has been brought up to obey and not to discuss. She is old enough now to forget all past youthful follies, he added, answering Don Ramon's defiant glance with one that conveyed a threat. Her devotion to her church, her king, and her country, and her hatred of Orange and all rebels will influence her actions in the way the lieutenant governor desires. Don Ramon was silent. He had understood the threat which de Vargas's glance had expressed, and he knew what the other meant when he spoke of past youthful follies, it meant the breaking off of a pleasing romance, a farewell to many an ambitious dream. Don Ramon suppressed a sigh of anger and of disappointment. Donna Lenora de Vargas was beautiful and wealthy, but it were not wise to let her father see how hard he, Ramon, had been hit. He took no further part in the discussion, and after a while he succeeded in appearing wholly indifferent to its sentimental side. But he listened attentively to all that was said, and when he met de Vargas's glance, which now and then was fixed mockingly upon him, he answered it with a careless shrug of his shoulders. And now, rejoined Pierre Arsens, who was president of Artois and a patrician of Hainault, may we ask if his highness has already chosen the happy man who is to become the husband of such a pattern of womanhood? My choice has naturally fallen on the son of Minheer Charles van Rick, the high bailiff of Ghent, replied Alva curtly. A family of traitors, if ever there was one, growled Alberic del Rio savagely. I know them. The father is all right. So is the younger son, Mark. Younger, I believe, by only a couple of hours. A wastrel and something of a drunkard, so I understand. But the mother and the other son are impudent adherents of Orange. They have more than once drawn the attention of the chief inquisitor on themselves, and if I had my way with such cattle... I would have had the men hanged and the women burned long before this. Van Rick, said Alva coolly, is high bailiff of Ghent. 
He is a good Catholic, and so is his wife. He is a man of great consideration in the city, and his sons are popular. It has not been thought expedient to interfere with them up till now. But, bearing my schemes in mind, I have caused the man to be severely warned once or twice. These warnings have reduced him to a state of panic, and lately when my scheme had matured, I told him that my desire was that one of his sons should wend Don Juan de Vargas's daughter. He had no thought of refusal. In fact, his acceptance was positively abject. And on what grounds was the marriage suggested to him? questioned President Arsens. Grounds, Messire, retorted the Duke. We give no grounds or reasons for our commands to our Flemish subjects. We give an order and they obey. I told Minheer van Rick that I desired the marriage, and that was enough. Then, interposed President Viglui, with an attempt at jocularity, we shall soon be able to congratulate two young people on a happy event. You will be able to do that tomorrow, Messire, quoth the Duke. Signor de Vargas goes to Ghent for the purpose of affiancing the two young people together. The marriage ceremony will take place within the week. His Majesty hath approved of my scheme. He desires that we should expedite the marriage. Signor de Vargas is willing. Messire de Reich would not think of objecting. Don Lenora is heart-free. Why should we delay? Why, indeed, murmured Don Ramon under his breath. Donna Lenora, resumed Alva sententiously, is indeed lucky in that, unlike most women, she will be able to work personally for the glory of her king and country, if through her instrumentality we can bring Orange to the block and Ghent to her knees, there is no favor which her father could not ask of us. As he said this, he turned to de Vargas and stretched out his hand to him. De Vargas took the hand respectfully and bent over it in dutiful obedience. Now, seniors, resumed the duke more gaily, and once more addressing the full council board, you know the full reason of my projected journey to Ghent. I go up sensibly in order to inaugurate the statue of our sovereign king erected by my orders in the marketplace, but also in order to ascertain how our loyal worker will have progressed in that time. Donna Lenora de Vargas will have been the wife of Messire van Rijk for over a cent night by then. She will, and I mistake not, have much to tell us. In the meanwhile, Signor de Vargas will take up his residence in the city as vicarius criminalis. He will begin his functions tomorrow by presiding over the engagement of his daughter to the son of the high bailiff. There will be much public rejoicing and many entertainments during the week, and on the day of the wedding ceremony. To these, seniors, you are graciously bidden. I pray you go and mingle as far as you can with the crowd of uncouth and vulgar burghers, whose treachery seems to pierce even through their ill-fitting doublets. I pray you also to keep your eyes and ears open. If my conjectures are correct, much goes on in Ghent of which the Holy Inquisition should have cognizance. We are out on a special campaign against cunning traitors, and Ghent is our first objective. When we turn our soldiery loose into the city, yours, seniors, will be the first spoils. Ghent is rich in treasure and money. Those first spoils will be worth winning. Until that happy day, I bid you au revoir, gentle sirs, and let your toast be at every banquet, to the destruction of Ghent and to the death of Orange. After which long peroration the lieutenant governor intimated with a casual wave of his beringed hand that the sitting of the Grand Council was at an end. The illustrious councillors rose with alacrity. They were now in rare good humor. The parting speech of His Highness tickled their cupidity. The first spoils at the sacking of Ghent should mean a fortune for every member of the board. General de Norcarme had made a huge one at the sacking of Mons, and even younger officers like Don Ramon de Ligny had vastly enriched themselves when Mechlin was given over to the soldiers. One by one now the grave seniors withdrew, having taken respectful leave of His Highness. To the salute of the Netherlanders, of Vigli and Hessels, of Berlaymont and the others, the Duke responded with a curt bow. To de Vargas and del Rio, and also to Don Ramon, he nodded with easy familiarity. However obsequious the Netherlanders might be, however proven their zeal, their Spanish masters never allowed them to forget that there was a world of social distinction between a grandee of Spain and the uncouth burghers and even patricians of this semi-civilized land. 7. Having made his last obeisance before the Duke of Alva and taken leave of the grave seigneurs of the Grand Council, 
Don Ramon de Ligny bowed himself out of the room with all the ceremony which Spanish etiquette prescribed. As he did so, he noticed that at a significant sign from Alva, de Vargas and Alberic del Rio remained behind in the council chamber, even while all the Netherlanders were being dismissed. He watched these latter gentlemen, as one by one they filed quickly out of the house, loath even to exchange a few friendly words with one another on the doorstep, in this place where every wall had ears and every nook and cranny concealed a spy. He watched them with an air of supercilious contempt, oblivious of the fact that he himself had been not a little scared by the black looks cast on him by the all-powerful tyrant and merciless autocrat. The scare had been unpleasant, but it was all over now. Fate, that ever-fickle jade, seemed inclined to smile on him. The penniless scion of a noble race, he seemed at last on the high road to fortune. The command of the troops in Ghent was an unexpected gift of the goddess, whilst the sacking and looting of Mechlin had amply filled his pockets. But it was a pity about Donna Lenora. Don Ramon paused in the vast panelled hall, and instinctively his eyes wandered to the mirror, framed in rich Flemish carved wood, which hung upon the wall. By Our Lady, he had well nigh lost his self-control just now, under de Vargas's mocking gaze, and also that air of high breeding and sang-froid which became him so well. The thought of Donna Lenora, even in connection with her approaching marriage, caused him to readjust the set of his doublet and the stiff folds of his ruffle, and his well-shaped hand wandered lovingly up to his silky moustache. A sound immediately behind him caused him to start and turn. An elderly woman wrapped in a dark shawl and wearing a black veil right over her face and head was standing close to his elbow. Inez, he exclaimed, what is it? Yes, I beg of you, senor, whispered the woman. I am well nigh dead with terror at thought that I might be seen. The senorita knew that you would be here today. She saw you from the gallery above and sent me down to ask you to come to her at once. The senorita, broke in Don Ramon impatiently, and with a puzzled frown, is she here? Senor de Vargas won't let her out of his sight now. When he hath audience of the lieutenant governor or business with the council, he makes the senorita come with him. The Duke of Alva hath given her a room in this house, where she can sit while her father is at the council. By heavens above, why all this mystery? The senorita will tell your graciousness, said the woman. I beg of you to come at once. If I stay longer down here, I shall die of fright. And like a scared hen... Old Inez trotted across the hall without waiting to see if Don Ramon followed her. The young man seemed to hesitate for a moment. The call was a peremptory one, coming as it did from a beautiful woman whom he loved. At the same time, all that he had heard in the council chamber was a warning to him to keep out of de Vargas's way. The latter, if Inez spoke the truth, was keeping his daughter almost a prisoner, and it was never good at any time to run counter to Senor de Vargas. The house was very still. The Netherlanders had all gone. Two serving men appeared to be asleep on the porch. Otherwise, there came no sign of life from any part of the building. The heavy oak doors which gave on the anteroom of the council chamber effectually deadened every sound which might have come from there. Don Ramon smiled to himself and shrugged his shoulders. After all, he was a fool to be so easily scared. A beautiful woman beckoned, and he had not been forbidden to see her, so... After that one brief moment of hesitation, he turned to follow Inez up the stairs. The woman led the way round the gallery, then up another flight of stairs along a narrow corridor, till she came to a low door beside which she stopped. "'Go in, I pray you, senor,' she said. "'The senorita expects you.' The young man walked unannounced into the small room beyond. There came a little cry of happy surprise out of the recess of a wide dormer window, and the next moment Don Ramond held— Lenora de Vargas in his arms. 8. Lenora, with the golden hair and the dark velvety eyes, thus do the chroniclers of the time speak of her, notably the Sieur de Varnwick, who knew her intimately. Thus, too, de Velasquez paint her a few years after these notable events, all in white, for she seldom wore colored gowns, very stately, with the small head slightly thrown back, the fringe of dark lashes veiling the luster of her luminous eyes. But just at this moment there was no stateliness about Donna Lenora. She clung to Don Ramon, just like a loving child that had been rather scared and knows where to find protection, and he accepted her caresses with an easy, somewhat supercilious air of condescension. The child was so pretty and so very much in love. 
He patted her hair with gentle, soothing gesture, and thanked kind fate for this pleasing gift of a beautiful woman's love. "'I did not know that you were in Brussels,' he said after a while, and when he had led her to a seat in the window and sat down beside her. "'All this while I thought you were still in Segovia.' His glance was searching hers, and his vanity was pleasantly stirred by the fact that she was pale and thin, and that those wonderful, luminous eyes of hers looked as if they had shed many tears of late. Ramon, she whispered, you know. The Duke of Alva, he replied dryly, gave me official information. Then, seeing that she remained silent and dejected, he added peremptorily, Lenora, how long is it since you have known of this proposed marriage? Only three days, she replied tonelessly. My father sent for me about a month ago. The Duchess of Medina Collier was coming over to the Netherlands on a visit to her lord, and I was told that I must accompany her. We started from Laredo in the Esperanza on the 10th of last month, and we landed at Flushing a week ago. Oh, at first I was so happy to come. It is nine months and more since you left Spain, and my heart was aching for a sight of you. Then, when did you first hear? Three days since, when we arrived in Brussels, the Duchess herself took me to my father's house, and then he told me that he had bade me come because the lieutenant governor had arranged a marriage for me with another lender. Don Ramon muttered an angry oath. Did he, your father, I mean, never hint at it before, he asked. Never. A month ago he still spoke of you in his letters to me. Had you no suspicions, Ramon? None, he replied. It was he, of course, who obtained for you that command under Don Frederick, who took you out of Spain. It was a fine position, and I accepted it gladly and unsuspectingly. It must have been the beginning. He wanted you out of my way already then, though he went on pretending all this while that he favored your attentions to me. He thought that I would soon forget you. How little he knows me. And now he has forbidden me to think of you again. Since I am in Brussels, he hardly lets me out of his sight. He only leaves the house in order to attend on the Duke, and when he does, he brings me here with him. Inis and I are sent up to this room, and I am virtually a prisoner. It all seems like an ugly dream, Lenora, he murmured sullenly. Aye, an ugly dream, she sighed. Oft times since my father told me this awful thing, I have thought that it could not be true. God would not allow anything so monstrous and so wicked. I thought that I must be dreaming, and must presently wake up and find myself in the dear old convent at Segovia, with your farewell letter to me under my pillow. She was gazing straight out before her, not at him, for she felt that if she looked on him, all her fortitude would give way and she would cry like a child. This she would not do, for her woman's instinct had already told her that all the courage in this terrible emergency must come from her. He sat there, moody and taciturn, all the while that she longed for him to take her in his arms and to swear to her that never would he give her up, never would he allow reasons of state to come between him and his love. There are political reasons, it seems, she continued, and the utter wretchedness and hopelessness with which she spoke were a pathetic contrast to his own mere sullen resentment. My father has not condescended to say much. He sent for me and I came. As soon as I arrived in Brussels, he told me that I must no longer think of you. That childish folly, he said, must now come to an end. Then he advised me that the lieutenant governor had arranged a marriage for me with the son of Messire van Rick, high bailiff of Ghent, that we were to be affianced tomorrow and married within the week. I cried. I implored. I knelt to my father and begged him not to break my heart, my life. I told him that to part me from you was to condemn me to worse than death. Well, and, he queried, you know my father, Ramon, she said with a slight shudder, almost as well as I do. Do you believe that any tears would move him? He made no reply. Indeed, what could he say? He did know that Juan de Vargas knew that such a man would sacrifice without pity or remorse everything that stood in the way of his schemes or his ambition. I was not even told that you would be in Brussels today. Inez only heard of it through the Duke of Alva's serving men, then she and I watched for you, because I felt that I must at least be the first to tell you the awful, awful news. Oh, she exclaimed with sudden vehemence, the misery of it all. Ramon, can you not think of something? Can you not think? Are we going to be parted like this, as if our love had never been, 
as if our love were not sweet and sacred and holy, the blessing of God which no man should have the power to take away from us. She was on the point of breaking down, and Don Ramon, with one ear alert to every sound outside, had much ado to soothe and calm her. This he tried to do, for selfish as he was, he loved this beautiful woman with that passionate, if shallow, ardor which is characteristic in men of his temperament. Lenora, he said after a while, it is impossible for me to say anything for the moment. Fate and your father's cruelty have dealt me a blow which has half stunned me. As you say, I must think. I am not going to give up hope quite as readily as your father seems to think. By Our Lady, I am not just an old glove that can be so lightly cast aside. I must think. I must devise. But in the meanwhile... He paused, and something of that same look of fear came into his eyes which had been there when in the council chamber he had dreaded the Duke of Alva's censure. In the meanwhile, my sweet, he added hastily, you must pretend to obey. You cannot openly defy your father, nor yet the Duke of Alva. You know them both. They are men who know neither pity nor mercy. Your father would punish you if you disobeyed him. He has the means of compelling you to obey. But the Duke's wrath would fall with deathly violence upon me. You know as well as I do that he would sacrifice me ruthlessly if he felt that I was likely to interfere with any of his projects, and your marriage with the Netherlander is part of one of his vast schemes. The look of terror became more marked upon his face, his dark skin had become almost livid in hue, and Lenora clung to him, trembling, for she knew that everything he said was true. They were like two birds caught in the net of a remorseless fowler. To struggle for freedom were worse than useless. De Vargas was a man who had attained supreme power beside the most absolute tyrant the world had ever known. Every human being around him, even his only child, was a mere pawn in his hands for the great political game in which the Duke of Alva was the chief player. A mere tool for the fashioning of that monstrous chain which was destined to bind the low countries to the chariot wheels of Spain. A useless tool, a superfluous pawn, he would throw away without a pang of remorse, this Don Ramon knew, and so did Lenora. But in Ramon that knowledge reigned supreme and went hand in hand with terror, whilst in the young girl there was all the desire to defy that knowledge and to make a supreme fight for love and happiness. I must not stay any longer now, my sweet, he said after a while. If your father has so absolutely forbidden you to see me, then I have tarried here too long already. He rose and gently disengaged himself from the tender hands which clung so pathetically to him. I cannot let you go, Ramon, she implored. It seems as if you were going right out of my life, and that my life would go with you if you went. Sweetheart, he said a little impatiently, it is dangerous for me to stay a moment longer. Try and be brave. I'll not say farewell. We'll meet again. How? Let Inez be at the corner of the Brudhuis this evening. I'll give her a letter for you. In the meanwhile, I shall have seen your father. Who knows his decision may not be irrevocable. After all, you are the one being in the world he has to love and care for. He cannot willfully break your heart and destroy your happiness. She shook her head dejectedly, but the next moment she looked up, trying to seem hopeful. She believed that he suffered just as acutely as she did, and, womanlike, did not want to add to his sorrow by letting him guess too much of her own. She contrived to keep back her tears. She had shed so many of late that their wellspring had mayhap run dry. He folded her in his arms, for she was exquisitely beautiful, and he really loved her. Marriage with her would have been both blissful and advantageous, and his pride was sorely wounded at the casual treatment meted out to him by de Vargas. At the same time, the thought of defiance never once entered his head, for defiance could only end in death, and Don Ramon felt quite sure that even if he lost his beautiful fiancée, life still held many compensations for him in the future. Therefore he was able to part from Lenora with a light heart, whilst hers was overweighted with sorrow. He kissed her eyes, her hair, her lips, and murmured protestations of deathless love, which only enhanced her grief and inflamed all that selfless ardor of which her passionate nature was capable. Never had she loved Don Ramon de Ligny as she loved him at this hour of parting, Never, perhaps, would she love as fondly again. And he, with a last tender kiss, airily bade her to be brave and trustful, and finally waved her a cheery farewell. End of section 14
Leatherface by Baroness Orsi. 